moment to invite uh, uh, Daisy Amdani uh, to uh, uh, on the two third gender principle. Um, I don't even know um, where to start, but just to get into it um, on the two thirds gender principle because I think a lot has been said about uh, the Constitution, but I want to just go back to the beginning and to talk about what many people like to call the letter and the spirit of the Constitution, which is really about inclusivity. Because it's become very easy to forget why um, there was a push for a new constitutional order, there was a feeling that there was a lot of exclusion. Too much power centered in one institution, one individual, but also too many people left out because of the system, the systems that we had in place. Very centralized system so that it became very easy to marginalize and leave people out of development and governance issues. We remember when Kenya was a one-party uh, state that it was almost begging the state to bring development in your area and if you were a representative of that area and you were not showing due allegiance to the state, then the state would deny you inclusion in development and marginalize you so that there were places where the government operated with a very light touch and people were basically left to their own devices. There are whole uh, sections, groups of people who were virtually left out. And I think that it's important that we understand that, even as we take audit and take stock of the Constitution, that at its heart was that people wanted to be included in leadership governance, development, in the development of their country. Their voices wanted to be on that decision-making table so that we could guide it. And I think that one of the tragedies that has befallen the two-thirds gender principle is that it has been seen largely as a women's issue. And because it is seen as a women's issue, and we are largely a patriarchal society, it has been left to the women to fight this battle. Because even the traditional human rights institutions don't really take up the two-thirds issue as a core right within the Constitution as part of the inclusivity principle. And being a women's issue, you know, patriarchy has given legitimacy to male voices so that when the women speak, it's almost like we are just a congregation of mourners. And it becomes that much easier to deny us what is rightfully ours because we are, of course, the disadvantaged gender in terms of representation and all other things. Because even as we celebrate, because remember, even at the mobilization of uh, during the referendum campaigns, women were specifically targeted for their vote and they were told this is your constitution it guarantees you inclusion it guarantees you the right to inclusion in the political economic and social spheres so you must and women who traditionally are very religious remember that that um, the church the churches were against it they were in the no campaign and women who are traditionally religious actually broke ranks with with their religious leaders to vote because they were encouraged. And now we find ourselves still having to fight for that space. The two-thirds gender principle, while enshrined within the Bill of Rights, is one of the core principles of inclusivity. Even within our national values and principles, when we talk about non-discrimination, equality, equity, inclusivity, those are some of the core principles. And so for me, I think that even when we look at how the whole issue has played out, 
and that six years down the line, we still find ourselves fighting for a framework to implement the two-thirds principle. But even where there is no need for a framework, it is simply ignored. And for me, that is the thing that we need to look at. Because I've seen um, Kureyangu, Sauti Yangu, even as we go towards elections. And I'm glad Senator Omar is here. I'm disappointed that those, uh, the report, the reforms uh, suggestions actually sailed through uh, the Senate without much objection or even a voice being raised about the two-thirds issue. Because, in my opinion, and I stand to be corrected, because here we have several lawyers, I am not a lawyer, so I stand to be corrected, but I do believe that the two-thirds principle is a substantive electoral issue. Because when you go to Article 81 that talks about the principles of that the electoral system shall comply with, it talks about uh, Article 38, the guaranteed political rights, but it also talks about not more than two-thirds of the same gender in elective offices. It also talks about the other issue that we have also largely ignored, and that is the fair representation of persons with disability. Then it talks about universal suffrage. It talks about the right to secret balloting and all that. So if it is inconvenient for us to have more than two thirds, if it is inconvenient for us to have a mechanism to implement the not more than two thirds principle, then it is, at what point does it then become inconvenient or does the state decide for us that it is inconvenient for us to have free and fair elections or secret ballot or to deny us our political rights because if we can forego one we can forego another and that is the thing that i think that we should be looking at because we have said continually that the constitution is very clear that you shall have no more than two-thirds of the same gender, meaning at the very least, we should be starting at a third. A third is actually ground zero, not the end in sight. So we are taking it like a third is the end in sight. We have played around with this issue. We do not find it something worthy of being fought and what the state has done it has used the two-thirds principle to continue to delegitimize the constitution because they have gone to the extent of amending legislation to remove the two-thirds principle the national police service act tom was amended section 14 of the national police service act was amended to remove the requirement of the two-thirds so that they did not have to abide. And yet, when LSK went to court on the JSC amendments, they didn't see fit to address that issue. And that's why I keep saying that the two-thirds is treated as a women's issue and we should fight it out. We are looking at electoral reforms right now. If this country goes to the elections without a mechanism to implement the two-thirds, it then becomes very easy for anybody to go to court. I would, if I was a, a loser, one of the losers, and I felt that I had lost unfairly, that can be an issue that I can use to go to court to invalidate the elections because it has not met that principle. And while the AG managed to dodge that bullet by going to the Supreme Court, to get an advisory opinion that allowed for the 2013 general elections to take place without that mechanism, the Supreme Court advisory gave a timeline which has also been ignored. As the women's movement, we have tried. We put it in the hands of parliament and the political shenanigans kicked in. But we also put it in our own hands through the Green Amendment campaign, of which Kenya Human Rights uh, members which is a popular initiative, it has been an uphill task because it has been difficult to mobilize even resources around it. We need to collect 1 million signatures. I think we've gotten to 750,000 unverified signatures. Uh, and I say unverified because you remember what happened. And just when you think they just can't get 
worse, they lower the bar so much further and you're like, okay, and, and I'm sure by 2017, no offense, Omar, but you know that really the 11th parliament absolutely has to be the worst parliament in terms of lawlessness and selfishness and circumventing the katiba, working in concert with the executive to circumvent the constitution. And I think that it's time that, if I agree, we need to do political education. Kenyans are so in love with politics that we must move away from civic education to political education and begin to speak the language that they understand. But on this issue, on the two-thirds issue, we need to band together as the activists for basic rights and freedoms and for the implementation of the Constitution. Because if it is okay for them to ignore one part of the Constitution, it's okay for them to ignore another part. And I think that the two-thirds principle is a soft target. It is that one where you do not test the water with both the depth of the water with both your feet. So they have put their foot in and they have found it's actually not that deep because there's no pushback that's coming, you know? And and, and so they're like, you know what? Let's do this. And tomorrow, what will it be? Term limits? It has become a trend in East Africa. Tomorrow it might be term limits and we will be sitting here wondering where did the rain start beating us? He who says the crocodile gets eaten last. So for me, it is important that the two-thirds gender principle be implemented and be implemented in full. And we must also organize. I like that Boaz is um, vying, you know. And I think that that's one of the, you know, the, the, the challenges that we have being in the NGO world. Maybe Kepta, now that you're a farmer, you can buy. We need people who actually believe in the rule of law and the constitution to actually go in there and to begin to legislate and to lead. Those positions are there. At least I know to, a, to an extent, of Hassan Omar, I know that we have sat with you even as senator, to actually find a way out, you know, to, to, to get the implementation of um, the two-thirds. So, in closing, because even I can really, really go on, um, one of the most difficult things to change is ourselves. And it's also important that we understand who we are as Kenyans. We have a very dubious reputation as a country of passing very good laws, very good policies, and now a very good constitution. We were reminded by Jill and Yash, Guy, uh, about how many countries have actually copied the constitution of Kenya 2010. The constitution of Kenya 2010 is falling into the same trap that our laws and policies have fallen into. That it's okay, that we don't have to implement, that now we've passed it, it's okay, what's our next project? But we have to, we have to keep up the battle. And so, as Mugambi reminded us, eternal vigilance is the price that we must pay. And for us, for the two-thirds, that is the price that we must pay. And even though Parliament has decided to kill the Sijeni bill and to kill the Duale bill, we still have the Green Amendment, which is a popular initiative. And so I would ask all of us to really rally around it, if for no other reason, to show them that we are not going away and that we are not going to go away quietly and we're not going to let them get away with it. Because if we do, trust me, 2017, these people are masters of impunity. 2017, we'll be coming here to lick our wounds again. And if we let them do it, then the whole Katiba is really going to unravel because we still have the community land bills to pass. Those are like the serious issues that we need to deal with. And we know that we are dealing with some of the people who are really entrenched in those systems that have excluded people. So we have to rise to the occasion. And so I would encourage all of us Please join us. We will be going to court as well as, do, you know, revamping the Green Amendment. But next week we are in court. You want to be enjoined? Please do. Omar, one of the things we are going, our prayers will be to disband the parliament. 
Whether we are going to get a judge who will be brave enough to do it, we shall see. But for no other reason, just to let them know, we are serious about the Katiba and we are serious about our representation. And if you will not represent us, then we will represent ourselves. So please support the implementation of the two-thirds and make it part of your fight. Because if you lose the two-thirds, then you have lost everything else. And all the other rights as women that we celebrate, land rights, marriage rights, socioeconomic rights, we're going to start losing them. Because that exclusion of women is rooted in the unequal power structures. So we must put women in the center of that change by putting them on the leadership and decision-making table where their voice and perspectives are heard and implemented. Thank you.